All right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about documentation in the Ruby community. And um, but first, uh, I guess, who am I? Um, I'm Lauren Siegel. Uh, I blog. I tweet. Um, I use Ruby. I guess that's not surprising. Um, and most relevantly, I wrote a tool called Yard, uh, which hopefully some of you guys have used, if not seen. Um, call, um, at, uh, you can get it at yardoc.org. Um, it's a Ruby documentation tool. Um, and so why am I here? Um, the truth is I don't actually want to talk about Yard today. Um, and I'm not actually going to get into the technical details of how Yard works and stuff like that. So if you have questions about that, um, I'm around, and you can feel free to ask me about that. Uh, what I do want to talk about, though, is um, I want to talk about documentation in the Ruby community in general and, and why we don't take this seriously. And, and, and what I want to get out of is hopefully maybe some of you guys will start um, taking documentation more seriously. So it's, it's really not just about Yard. I don't care if you use Yard or RDoc or whatever tool you use. Um, the point is I want people to start uh, treating documentation as part of the development process rather than just something they do after. Um, and so why? Um, documentation is important. The first reason it's important is obviously because your users can figure out what the hell you're doing. Um, the, the second, there's, a side, there's an interesting side benefit to all this in that when you try to explain someone what your code does, it helps you realize that your code sucks. And it helps you, it helps you actually think about your API and, and maybe make it a lot, a lot easier. And so um, there are, I guess there are situations where um, people would uh, design classes or methods and when they start explaining them and documenting them, it takes them like five or six lines to explain it. If you, and, and, and the rule is if you can't explain it easily, then really you, you should start questioning the design and you should start questioning the implementation as well. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, is uh, good documentation is hard to find these days. There's this, there's this little problem in the Ruby community that we like to avoid in that... Um, our documentation is really not up to par, especially in the Ruby core and Ruby standard libraries. Um, so this is the signal exception class, uh, which um, is the, uh, some, some exception class. And basically, if you look at the, the actual documentation, it's really just cut and paste from the superclass exception. Um, and so uh, we would know, as Unix users, what a signal exception is. But it's really not obvious to, to someone who's not a Unix user what this exception does. And so this, stuff, this, is, this, this kind of stuff makes me sad. Um, and so here's another example of uh, the DBM class, which um, I don't think many people even know about, but in fact is packaged with the Ruby standard library. Um, and as you see up there on the, in that empty box there, those are the methods for DBM. Um, yeah, and so it's not documented, and that's, that's really, um, you know, it's, we need to get on that. We need to start documenting our, our standard library and our, and our core much better. The other thing I want to point out is that um, when you screw up documentation, you really screw up bad. And so this is an example of Rails, um, of a security vulnerability in Rails last year, in about June. Um, where you have the HTTP Digest authentication, um, and basically, uh, if you they told you if you return nil to the HTTP Digest authentication, um, it will uh, it won't let the user through. But in fact, it turned out that when you return nil to that block, it lets the user through. So so they had all this code because because not only was it documented that way, but they also had examples saying use this block of code in your code and it'll work. And that code let people through. And so um, this really is bad when you have these apps making into production code. And so um, they, they fix the problem, but, but the real question is, what is their risk avoidance strategy in this, in this case? What is their plan to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Um, and so generally the consensus is, well, okay, well, we'll pay better attention to our documentation. Hopefully we'll review it better. Um, but that, that's not really good enough, is it? Um, and so Yard, Yard actually has some, some things that I'll talk about later that, that make this easier to, to detect and, and fix. Um, so a quick show of hands. Who here writes libraries or frameworks that other people use? 
Okay, that's a fair number. Um, who here puts a um, puts a, a emphasis in the documentation when they write it? Okay, a smaller number of people. Um, so uh, what I found uh, from my experience is that uh, the number of people using Yard are relatively small. Um, the number of people writing RDoC is a little bigger, but uh, this doesn't say anything about the actual quality of the RDoC. Um, and then there's, Ru there's Ruby, wait. There's Ruby, um, and uh, note this is not to scale. Uh, this is purely from my own experience um, talking to people who write documentation, using code, uh, reading documentation, and stuff like that. Um, but, but the question is, why not? Why don't we do it? Um, one thing I usually hear, uh, not explicitly, of course, is uh, people, people get the this feeling that they don't have enough time. Um, and so my answer to that is, is make time. <laughs> and, and by the way, um, that blue is the same color as Jessica Alba's eyeshadow. <laughs> um, but, but, development, but documentation should really not be something that you say, well, if I have time after implementing all the features, I can sort of get around to explaining it to the users. And in the meantime, they could sort of sift through the source code and figure it out on their own, and et cetera. Um, this should be part of the development process. As you implement features, you should be documenting them. And that's how it should work. Um, obviously, this is a best case scenario. But, but this is how we should, re we should really be serious about this. And one of the reasons that it matters is, well, not your users won't, will like you, but your users won't hate you. And, and um, not pissing your users off is a lot better than if they're just sort of happy. Um, and the reason is, um, all those people that will get pissed off are the people who won't read your source code. And um, the truth is, they shouldn't have to. Because if they have to, um, if, if, they're ha if they have to go and read your source code, they might as well just develop it themselves. Um, and that brings me to my next point is, a lot of people like to say, um, my code is self-documenting. To that, I say, no. <laughs> um, the reason is, self-documenting doesn't scale. So you, when, when you refactor your code and make it look pretty and stuff like that, what you're doing is you're not, you're not reducing complexity. You're displacing it. You're moving those, uh, that complexity down a layer. But the problem is your users don't understand any of those layers. So they still have to read, as, as the last presentation said, from bottom up what that code does. And if you hide, uh, if you hide your ugly metaprogramming crap under a nice DSL, you still have this little nice shell that doesn't tell them anything about how it works. So um, this is an example of what people usually do for when people pass in options hashes into methods. They'll usually have this um, parse default options method. That, that parses out the default options um, for, the, for the method for the class. And you usually have many of these methods that parse these default options. Um, the problem with that is um, this method is usually hidden somewhere in the private methods of the class. Sometimes it might be mixed in from another module. Sometimes it might be inherited. Sometimes maybe both. Um, so, so expecting your users to find out all this information just to find out what the options are is, is, is really not, doesn't make any sense. Uh, the last thing people usually say is that documentation is hard. To that, I say, fair enough. Um, it is hard. Um, and so we'll get back to why it's, uh, how, how we can make it easier in, in a second. But uh, first, I want to talk about what makes documentation good. Um, so I generally have three rules, three major rules that, that sort of uh, talk about how, how to make good documentation. The first rule is consistency. Um, so documentation is like code. You pick a style, you stick to it, otherwise your users will get confused. Um, if, if, for instance, you start telling people this method will raise an exception, um, and then in the next method you don't say that, but it does, um, you're confusing your users because they don't know wh whether uh, you didn't document it, you forgot, um, if it doesn't raise an exception, that information is not clear. So pick a style, stick to it. The second rule is, is correctness. Um, documentation, again, is like code. It can be wrong. We don't even know it will be wrong if it is. Um, and so just like code, um, we generally have this acceptance in the community that w be, the reason that we test is because we sort of have this assumption that our code will be wrong. Um, but but there's, this weird, um, there's this weird disconnect in that we don't make this assumption about documentation. We sort of assume that, yeah, of course I documented properly. Of course I explained it right. Um, but in fact, documentation has to be reviewed, has to be audited and tested, just like our code does. 
The third thing is uh, coherency. And so documentation, again, is like code. It always makes sense to the person who wrote it. It never makes sense to anyone else. Um, and so the, the lesson here is that documentation has to be reviewed by uh, other people. The, the worst person to write your documentation is the person who wrote the code, because they know all the bad things about that code, and nobody ever will, under, will care about those details. Um, so, yeah, so hard, yeah. Um, and so that's kind of why I came up with the art, uh, to try and make some of these things easier. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so um, Yard's goals are sort of in the same vein as those uh, documentation is good stuff. Um, it, it tries to go for consistency, correctness, and coherency. Uh, the extensibility comes for free uh, through the way Yard was designed. Um, consistency. So Yard basically adds metadata to your information in the form of uh, Java doc style um, uh, param return tags. Um, and so this is, this is found in uh, Objective-C, Java, Java um, Python has this, uh, JavaScript, some documentation is starting to use this documentation format. Um, so this is not new. Um, and so, so this makes your documentation consistent because Yard knows exactly where to find this information and it can pull this information out consistently into your HTML. Um, and, and that matters. And so you'll notice there's also uh, type information there. That also helps with consistency and correctness. Um, <laughs> which is this, um, Yard basically through the extensibility part lets you write tools to get at those, that, that information that we just added. And so we can actually test all, our, all of the stuff that we just wrote. And so uh, when we were talking about that Rails vulnerability before, um, what they could have done was add a return nil tag or return nil or false and actually t written a test for that and tested their documentation. Uh, against that. Data Mapper is actually doing a really good job of this. Uh, their APIs, their API documentation is being really well written. Um, and Dan Cub, who uh, maintains Data Mapper, uh, actually wrote a tool called Yardstick, which is sort of like a, a lint style thing for your documentation, making sure you have the right parameters, right return tags, uh, examples for your public API methods, etc. And uh, you can extend that too to have your own rules. Um, coherency is mostly up to you, um, but basically, um, because uh, basically coherency is, is up to how well you describe your method, of course, um, but Yard does try to make it easier for you um, to do this. And so um, it makes it easier by, by, by doing the, the templates in a, in a very easy to read for, format. And so here are some examples. Hopefully, uh, yeah, you can see that. Um, on the left, you see the uh, class list, and it's hierarchical. So you actually have the namespaces uh, in, in the, the namespaces split up, so you can actually go inside the yard namespace to find out where everything else is. Um, and there's also a search there at the top, so you can search through classes, methods, and et cetera. Um, on the right, you see at the top, you see how the parameters, the yield tags, return tags, and stuff like that are formatted in a consistent and fashion, so it's a lot easier to read. Uh, you can also have references to other classes, so there's a lot more information that you can uh, throw into a method in a, in a very easy to read fashion. Um, and of course, uh, at the bottom, you, you see the, the full inheritance tree for each class, um, unlike RDoc, which just shows the parent class, uh, which is not always as useful. And um, of course, in, on yardoc.org, uh, there are live docs, just like rdoc.info if you've ever used it. Um, yardoc.org has live docs. Um, and in these live docs, you can actually have live inline comments. Um, and um, if you've ever used php.net, php.net has this functionality, arguably one of the best features of PHP. Um, and uh, yeah, and, um, and so, so there's no reason we shouldn't borrow at least their good ideas. Um, and so extensibility. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can extend Yard. And so the way we did the, the correctness and, and the consistency stuff is through, through extensions and plugins. Um, three plugins that, um, that, you can, that, uh, the, um, that I recommend looking at, uh, Yard RSpec, Yard Sinatra, and Yard Pigments. Um, the first one throws your RSpec specifications into, alongside your method docs. We'll see that in a sec. 
uh, Yard Sinatra throws your, uh, your routes into your docs, so you can actually document DSLs with that with Yard. Um, it has a parser API. And uh, Yard Pigments, if you've ever used Pigments, uh, is, uh, allows you to do syntax highlighting for other languages. And so uh, this is what Yard RSpec looks like. Uh, as you see under the returns tag, you can see specifications for that method. Uh, and you can actually go into the code for that specification alongside your docs, which is useful if you're doing proper RSpec. Um, you can actually have self-documenting code in some sense. Um, the next one is Yard Sinatra, which uh, shows your get routes. As you see, this is actually yardoc.org site. Um, and so you can actually document each of those um, and show them properly and figure out what your, what your API does. And if you have a REST API for some other for, for a service, you can actually uh, publish your docs like this, maybe change up the template to make it custom, but you can show your users how to use your service like this. Um, so what's the conclusion on, in all this? Um, the conclusion is we need to try and work at better, better documentation. Um, like I said before, it has to be part of the development process, um, and we need to take it more seriously. Um, I guess the reason people don't do it is um, because it's hard. Um, but, but with Yard and with other tools um, and with plugins, uh, it can be easier. And so I guess what I'm getting at is um, hopefully if you write or maintain a library or framework and you didn't raise your hand when I asked before, hopefully you'll change your mind um, and start, maybe you got some ideas from this, uh, and start thinking about documenting your code in a more serious manner. Um, if you don't write a library or framework and you have some time to give back to the community, the community needs better documentation for the standard library and core. So I highly recommend, um, uh, if you're interested, either talk to, to come up to me and, and talk to me, because I'm interested, too, uh, in, in writing better documentation for, for the standard library. Um, and this is uh, the Yard information. You can install gem install Yard, uh, yardoc.org, and you can host your docs just like rdoc.info at yardoc.org slash docs. Um, I guess I'm a little short here because I thought I was going to go longer, but um, so that's about it. Uh, any questions? Yeah, uh, yeah, you on the left there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll talk later. <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> uh, you on the other side of the aisle there. Um, theor theoretically, um, you, you need to write a parser for it, but, but theoretically, you can. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, par yeah, it's parsing Ruby. Um, there's actually a Ruby parser. There's also a C parser to handle the C extensions, um, but that's, that's not really a parser. It's just a regex stuff, actually. A lot of it's taken from our doc, borrowed from our doc. I want to improve it to make a better C parser so that people can extend that too. Uh, yes, you? Okay. Um, so right now, there's no explicit way to do that. However, it's very easy um, to write um, code because because all this all this information is really just stored inside like um, a Marshall dump. You can actually just load up that Marshall dump, add that information in. Uh, it would be a little hacky, um, but you can actually just do that and save out the database. Um, and then when you generate the docs, it'll actually uh, do that. So you can write a nice wrapper around that that kind of thing if you wanted to. Uh, yeah, you. Okay. Uh -huh. 
Okay, so right. So there's actually a way to do that. You have to have a, a well in your RDoc you can actually do this with a dot document file inside the directory. Uh, Yard has a, supports the doc document file, but it also has a dot Yard ops file, so you can specify uh, options to pass into Yard when it runs on that on code inside that directory. So it's, yeah, it has it has to be implemented. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of unfortunate. It has to be done like that. Maybe um, maybe there could be a way to, to run Yard on a website while passing in parameters that you would control. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. So there's a, there's actually I actually wrote a couple I, I gave a couple talks um, back in Montreal where I'm from on on Yard and and there's actually um, a, a little example I wrote in like 15 lines. Um, if you go to my GitHub uh, GitHub.com/lsegal, same as my Twitter username, uh, lsegal, um, you can uh, you can check out there's a there's a repository called Yard Examples I think and it actually has um, a way to run specs on your doc examples. Um, so you can actually grab all the example tags or even just any embedded code block uh, and run specs uh, on that, assuming you follow like uh, code, uh, hashtag, uh, comment line, uh, that kind of syntax. You can actually do it like the same way Python does. Uh, any other? Yeah. Probably. Right. Okay. Um, well, you can you can write a custom template. Um, it wouldn't be too complicated to to basically if you were just wanting to get all the methods of that class, um, you would basically just do. Um, so actually, maybe I have some time for a demo real quick. Ah, whoa. Uh, um, so So that, that would be the doc string. Um, and so you can actually get at um, all the meths that are included um, and inherited. And so if you, you could actually write uh, your own template to basically, um, uh, hold on. And so you could basically do that, uh, and if you, you could customize your template to have that information for, for all your classes, and then that would be uh, that method plus all the modules that are mixed in. Um, and so, yeah, you could, you could write the template to do that, or you can, if you wanted to, you can ha have your own hosted live docs uh, to just do that as well if you, if you wanted to build out a special Rails uh, docs site. <laughs> Maybe the Rails guys would be interested in that. Um, any other questions? Yeah, it's it's, base, it's a basic Marshall format. I was actually um, right now. It's it's actually sort of like a set of Marshall formats, like stored inside the directory. Um, each each class has its own file for like optimization purposes. Um, but um, yeah, it's basically just a Marshall dump. I was looking at ways so you could theoretically write adapters for like SQL, so you could port all that stuff out to SQL. You could also, if you didn't want to do that, you can actually just take the Marshall dump and do it after, sort of. You could grab the Marshall dump and just read out all the stuff and put it into SQL afterwards. Um, but I actually, I was toying around with the idea of, of having different backends like SQL um, and stuff like that. But it's, it, it makes it the, the design of the, 
of the of the models a lot more a little bit more complex. Uh, any other questions? Nope. Oh, there's one over there. So, so the, actually, I did I did play around with with auto linking inside a code of view source, um, but but I guess the the real answer here would be um, maybe the code should be documented better, um, but but I won't get into that. Um, um, but you can you can in some cases um, auto link some methods. You can definitely auto link constants, which I actually have a branch of that does that. Um, and so methods are a little harder because of dynamic dispatch. Uh, and because of the dynamic nature of Ruby, but but in some cases you could sort of get that. The only problem, the only reason it's not in in Yard right now is because it makes syntax highlighting a lot slower, and that's something people generally don't want. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks all. <laughs>